This is a guided video tour of the alimentary canal and accessory digestive organs from the perspective of the models. So the alimentary canal begins in the oral cavity, continues down the pharynx and esophagus, into the stomach, then into our small and large intestine, and ends at the rectum which leads into the anal canal. So in the oral cavity, we have an intermucosal layer that is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. The muscularis layer isn't special and the um, adventitia surrounds the back layer. From the oral cavity, food will enter the oropharynx. The pharynx has three regions. Again, the nasopharynx is covered in pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. That's more important in the respiratory system. In the digestive system, when we get to the oropharynx, this is lined with our non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Food will pass in, past the laryngopharynx, which is also lined with our non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So on this model, if we pull back our trachea, we can see the superior esophageal sphincter, which leads into the esophagus. The esophagus is this muscular tube that conducts the uh, bolus of food through the diaphragm and into the stomach. So this is the stomach. If we look at a model of the stomach, from the gross anatomy perspective, um, our inferior esophageal sphincter is going to allow the bolus of food to pass into this region of the stomach here called the cardia. This region that sits superiorly to the cardia is called the fundus. This is the body that has the greater curvature and the lesser curvature. And then this kind of smaller end at the called the pylorus. The pylorus leads through this sphincter called the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. But before we move away from the stomach, let's look at some other parts of its anatomy. Look at the internal anatomy of the stomach. We can see that this submucosa folds with the mucosa to form these folds called gastric folds or rugae, and they increase the surface area of the stomach. The mucosal layer of the stomach has simple columnar epithelium that form gastric pits that produce gastric juice. From the stomach, food will exit through this sphincter called the pyloric sphincter before it goes on to the small intestine. As far as other specializations of the wall, the stomach has an additional smooth muscle layer called the oblique layer, which uh, wraps the stomach at an angle. Then it has its middle circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. From the stomach, food will enter what's called the duodenum of the small intestine, where we will also be receiving our pancreatic juice and bile. So this first region of the small intestine is the duodenum. Duodenum extends away into the jejunum. The jejunum continues into the ileum, and you can see the ileum meets up with our cecum of our large intestine at this ileocecal valve. The small intestine is specialized to increase its surface area, and it does so in three ways. First, by folding into what are called circular folds, as seen here. And this is caused by the folding of the mucosa and submucosa. And then if you look at the mucosal layer, we can see that our lamina propria folds with the epithelial layer. And this is due to the fact that the muscularis mucosa is shorter than both of these other layers. And so what this does is create what's called an intestinal villus. So the surface of the mucosa is covered in these intestinal villi that are again caused by the folding of our lamina propria with the epithelium. So this is the second way that the small intestine can increase surface area. The mucosa of the small intestine is simple columnar epithelial cells and each of these also has microvilli. So that's the third way that the small intestine increases its absorptive surface area and I guess digestive surface area because the small intestine is producing uh, our brush border enzymes that help finish up chemical digestion. The other structures that you can see here in the layer of the small intestine are our specialized lymphatic capillaries called lacteals that absorb lipids. 
So they will absorb these and conduct them into our lymphatics that will drain into the cisterna chile and conduct the lipids into the thoracic duct. As far as other layers of the small intestine wall go, there's nothing too special. This is our inner circular muscular layer. Uh, this is our submucosa that's bringing in our branches of our blood vessels. This is our... As far as the other layers of our small intestine wall go, there's nothing too special going on. This is our submucosa that contains the branches of our um, arteries, veins, and lymphatics, and nerves that serve the intestine. This is our outer muscularis layer. This is our, uh, of the muscularis layer, we've got two layers, our inner circular layer and our outer longitudinal layer. And then in the small intestine, we're covered by serosa. From the small intestine, material will pass into the large intestine, which has different regions. This first portion that's receiving our material from our ileocecal valve is called the cecum. The cecum leads into the ascending colon. The, the ascending colon curves into the transverse colon. The transverse colon curves and leads to the descending colon. The descending colon curves into what's called the sigmoid colon. And then at the inferior portion, we have our rectum and anal canal. So the rectum is seen here, is the temporary storage site for solid waste, and it leads into the anal canal. To look at the accessory organs that are found along the route of our alimentary canal, we can see in the oral cavity our accessory organs are the teeth, which help with the mechanical breakdown of food, the tongue, which helps to manipulate the bolus of food and form it uh, along the hard palate, which is going to lead back into our oropharynx. Other parts of the mouth that are important are the hard palate, which helps to form our bolus of food, the soft palate, which ha has this region called the uvula hanging off of it. When you swallow, the soft, as you push that bolus of food back along the soft palate and it gets to this area in the back by the uvula, you'll stimulate tactile receptors that will push the uvula up so that it blocks the nasopharynx. The laryngopharynx is going to um, be protected by um, the epiglottis, which will flop down and protect the larynx so that the material passes just through to our esophagus. Other structures that are accessory organs in the mouth are our salivary glands. And here, just under the tongue, we can see the sublingual salivary glands. Over here, we see the submandibular salivary glands. And on this side right here, we see the parotid salivary glands. So these are extrinsic salivary glands that are found outside the oral mucosa. The oral mucosa has intrinsic salivary glands that um, also secrete saliva. Our other accessory digestive organs are the liver and the gallbladder, which help to, uh, with fat digestion, the liver by producing bile and the gallbladder by concentrating and storing it. So this liver sits in your right upper quadrant. If we pull it out and look at it, things that we can see are this branch of the hepatic portal vein, which is going to bring in blood from our in, uh, superior and inferior mesenteric veins in addition to our splenic vein. It brings that nutrient-rich blood in past our hepatocytes for filtering. This is our hepatic artery, which is bringing in oxygenated blood. The liver produces bile and releases it into our right and left hepatic ducts. The right and left hepatic ducts lead to this common hepatic duct, which will then form uh, the common bile duct with the cystic duct that is taking uh, bile to and from the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is this pear-shaped organ that stores and concentrates our bile. And when you're eating, that bile is then released into the duodenum of your small intestine to help with fat digestion. Other things to recognize about the liver, this is the right lobe, this is the left lobe, this is the caudate lobe, this is the quadrate lobe. After blood has been filtered past our hepatocytes, it will be collected in what are called central veins that converge to become our hepatic veins that drain into the inferior vena cava. 
The other accessory organ we have is the pancreas, which has both endocrine and exocrine functions. For digestion, the important exocrine function is the secretion of pancreatic juice. So our pancreatic acid in our cells produce pancreatic juice, release it into little ductules that will eventually merge and drain into this main pancreatic duct that then drains into the duodenum of the small intestine.